Hey everybody, this is Jason. Welcome to Liberty Live. Today we're going to be discussing Reuben, otherwise known as Reuben, the firstborn son of Yaakov, who wrestled with God and his name was changed to Israel. Now, the name Reuben means behold a son or see a son. And this name, Ru or Roi, Ro Ben, Ben is son, Ro is see, gets its name from Genesis when Hagar and Ishmael are sent out of Abraham's house because of the discourse between Itzhak and Ishmael and the dispute of who's going to be the firstborn son. God's promise is with Isaac, so Hagar and Ishmael are cast out. And without food and water later and dying of thirst, she cries out to God and behold, there appears a well in a dry place and she calls the name El Rohai for behold, you are the God who sees. El God Rohai who sees. So, Roben or Ruven is see a son. Ben is son, Ru is see. So, God who sees El Rohai or Roel or El Rohai, and Ben, Roben, Ruven is actually behold or I see a son. Now, this is the firstborn son of all the patriarchs of Israel. So, you have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Reuben. Now, Jacob's changed to Israel. Reuben is Reuben. The firstborn right belongs to him. But we see later in the story, he does something to disqualify himself, even as Esau did, from the first right blessing. He laid with his father's concubine, who was also the mother of some of the federal tribes. This was a big mistake he made in his youth. Forty years later, when the blessing comes upon him, expecting to receive the firstborn right of blessing, and it reads... Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the excellence of my strength and power, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. Unstable as water, however, you shall not receive preeminence because you went up to your father's bed and then you defiled it. You even went to my couch. Now, this defilement of committing adultery ultimately with his mother-in-law cost him his firstborn blessing. As a matter of fact, it then went to Joseph's sons, as we see here in a neighboring account in 1 Chronicles 5. The sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but because he defiled his father's couch, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, so that he could not be enrolled as the oldest son. Now, what was this birthright? It was the double portion. And we know historically that, that now goes to Ephraim and Manasseh. The double portion now goes to Ephraim and Manasseh, who are the last, now become the first because the first was disqualified. And because prophetically, God wanted to show that disobedience and the righteousness by faith was preeminent. That the disobedience of a firstborn, just because you're born first, doesn't mean you can't obey. We see like in the prodigal son, just because you're the firstborn does not mean that you get the right to the blessings. You must ask, you must seek, you must knock, you must hunger, you must thirst. We also see for an example, as in Jacob and Esau, <clears throat> that Jacob desired the blessing. Not just that, yeah, it's mine, whatever, you know, whether I like it or not, or I'm just going to receive it expectantly, or what they call an entitlement, but I desire this from God. I desire... And by the way, you know, the firstborn blessing is not just to honor the one who opens the womb. It's, it's not just to honor the one who's holy, though they do open the womb and they are holy. They must be redeemed and given to God as such because it is the wellspring of life, the gift to extend a generation in the, in the family strength and name from a generation to a generation. But the idea with the firstborn blessing is that the firstborn needs extra horsepower to serve his siblings, to take care of his parents when they're older. He needs more funds, more strength, more wit, more everything to help and to serve. We also see in David's family even though the firstborn got the blessing, who became the king? Not the firstborn. It was the one in the field who desired it. You see, we must hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, Reuben's symbol in a lot of the prayer shawls, tallits, and the ephod is a turquoise or emerald gemstone. By the way, do you know that the birth stones we have in our culture, in other words, you're born in February, March, April, May, and there's a little stone uh, connected to each, which is in earrings or or you know, in some type of symbology. Well, these birthstones come from the ephod, the breastplate, the cushion of the tribes of Israel, each son having their own name engraved on their own stone with meanings and value, starting all the way back in the book of Exodus. And this now 
comes to us in our culture in the form of birthstones. This is the original origin. We also know about Reuven is they, they uh, give him a pictograph symbol as a waves because he's unstable as the water, meaning you're strong and you're tranquil, but then you're all over the place. Now, a couple good things Reuben did. Number one, when Joseph became uh, aggressed by his brothers and they wanted to get rid of him, Reuben is the one who stood up and said, do not kill him. Do not let that blood be on our hands. It's innocent blood. Don't let the blood of the son of our father be upon us. So he said, throw him in this well. And then he went away and they ended up selling him to Ishmaelite traders coming with caravans of camels and balm. Speaking of balm, do you know the balm of Gilead is a resin from one of the trees in Gilead where Reuben the tribe ended up settling. The balm of Gilead comes from the Camphora Gileadesis tree. Like Camphora mora, like Baswala sacra, the Camphora tree, the balm of Gilead specifically, is balm, which is a resin that flows from the tree. Much like myrrh, much like frankincense, balsam or balm is actually balm, resin, before it hardens that comes from a tree, a sap. The Bospola sacred tree sap dries, it's known as frankincense, the king of kings. The camp for a myrrh tree sap dries and is known as myrrh, the famous biblical uh, resin. Balm of Gilead is balsam from the same camphora gileadesis tree, and it's used for medicinal purposes, for soothing, healing, and ailing, and is able to be put in a salve to make biblical anointments or anointing oil used to heal. Jeremiah said, is there not balm of Gilead for the people? Is there no balm in Gilead? Meaning, is there no healing in your heart? Is there no righteousness within you? Is there no forgiveness? This was a major thing in the old world. And remember, the balm of Gilead came from the place of Reuben. So we end up finding out that a lot of good can come from this, that, that God uses all things for the good. So even though he lost the firstborn blessing, his tribe was a lot. They had a lot of cattle and livestock. And when walking with Moses, something very interesting, they're walking into the promised land and he said, hey, Moses, let us settle on the other side of the Jordan and not cross over. And Moses goes, why would you do that? You're not going to go with us. You're not going to fight with us. You're, you know, you're going to rebel against us and join our enemies. They said, no, 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 no. We will go with you and help everyone with arms. We'll go to war with you and get everyone home. In other words, we'll walk you to your car. And when everyone is home safe, then we'll go back over and settle in the land of Gilead, which is the place of Yazar which means help. In other words, the balm of Gilead, help of healing, where the Lord helps. This is where the Lord is able to help to, to salve and to atone and to anoint. They wanted to stay there because they had tons of livestock, sheep, cattle, you name it. And they wanted to make houses for their families. And it was a good land. By the way, remember, this was the land formerly owned by Og, king of Bashan, and Sihon, king of the Amorites. Who's Og and Sihon? They were giants. We even know by the cubits of his bed how long Og, the king of Bashan, and Sihon, king of Amorites, how big his bed was. It was 13 cubits, which in the, in the ancient cubit in the Bible, anywhere from 18 to 24 inches, that these were Nephilim giants. They were the descendants who the same was Goliath of Gath, who David slew with his sling. So these were unusually large men, uh, formidable enemies of like ogres, if you will, and giants, literally, descendants of the fallen angels. And when Moses destroyed them, they're, obviously they had pick of the land. This was still a very wonderful bounty. But again, being on the other side of the Jordan posed as a problem. So they go help the tribes get nestled in, if you will, get safely home. And they come back and settle in. And then the problem is that they knew in the future, you guys will say, we're on the other side of the Jordan and we have no inheritance with you, and that's not true. So what they did is they built a life-size replica altar of the one at the Mishkan that ended up settling in Shiloh for 369 years. This was the brazen altar. Here is a model of it here. And this is the one that offered burnt sacrifices, uh, which is Corbinot, to draw near to God, fellowship offerings, guilt offerings, sin offerings, uh, grain offerings, and ultimately, which is the altar through which the coals from the wood reduced and went inside to the golden altar to offer the prayers of the saints, right, inside the holy place. Now, when the other tribes found out about it, they came back and said, what is this that you're trying to do? Don't you remember the sons of Korah who rebelled? In which case, Dathan and Abiram, 
who joined in that rebellion were from the tribe of Reuben. So obviously we know, hey, this runs in your blood, really? And those people were swallowed up and it caused a reproach in all of Israel. Really, you guys are going to do that again? And all of a sudden we find they go, no, 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 no. That was never a heart in the first place. We did not build this for burnt offerings, grain offerings, fellowship offerings, or guilt offerings. We only built this as a replica so you would know that we know that we are in. We're part of you. We saw that with our own eyes. Otherwise, we couldn't have made a replica of it. We're still going to offer burnt offerings here in the tabernacle. We're still going to come here during the appointed times because only the Lord's altar is blessed. Where the Lord said is the place is the place. Anything else is a trespass. But we don't want you to forget about us later on when your children's 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 take possession and inheritance of the land and forget about us that we were supposed to cross over the Jordan. Why didn't you cross over? And at this, everyone had peace and they did not go to war. And so we see that, again, losing the blessing and then fighting for an inheritance, doing the right thing like a big brother, but still being counted on the outskirts. Moses has uh, what we would think is finally a compassion. And Moses also blesses Reuben. And he says, you know what, Reuben, may you not die and may your people be few. In other words, it kind of puts a, a stop to the curse, if you will, because of his own actions. Uh, Reuben disqualified himself and you would think he would live a life of shame, him and his descendants, and subsequently so. No one came to power. There's no prophet, no prince, no priest, nor, nor king from the tribe of Reuben since the defilement. And otherwise so, we would have said, yeah, maybe, maybe great rulers would have come from the firstborn. Isn't that an inheritance? So the good that we have from Reuben is to see that by him stopping Joseph from being killed, he actually was used to save Israel as well. Think about this. Joseph was used as a savior of Israel. Reuben saved Joseph's life. Otherwise, the brothers would have killed him. So we know that God still merits him. And by the way, you can't change the, you know, your firstborn blessing, whether you're tall, small, you know, uh, your hair is black, white, gray, brown, you know, blonde, you can't change that, I mean, organically by God. But you can decide whether you want to be righteous, repentant, submissive, forgiving. And these are the weightier matters that God truly looks at. Remember, the Old Testament priesthood was by the blood. The New Testament priesthood is by devotion, not duty, devotion. In other words, you have to choose to be right with God. You can't just be right-blooded. And they still had to behave, but you understand what I'm saying. In the Old Testament, you were because you were born into it. In the New Testament, you are because you're born again, which is also by your agreement. You're born in the flesh. You have no power over that to be born again. You do have a choice. For what is born of flesh of flesh, what is born of spirit and spirit. This is why those who choose to obey and order the Lord Jesus Christ will have full reward. Now, one last thing about Reuben. Behold, a son, the son that comes first, was used to save the people of Israel. Now, obviously, he's an archetype of the only begotten son, the firstborn, who came first to stop the death of other people. Isn't it fitting that one man should die so that all the people of Israel don't have to die or on behalf of all the people? In other words, if one man stops a death, then other people live by the power of his name. So in other words, Joseph lived because a son stood in the gap. Because someone was interceding for him. Someone said, this far, no further. I will not let this happen. And that's what God looks for, beloved, by the way. When you stand in the name of Jesus Christ, God looks for you to stand in his name, in the vestige of his name, in the power of his purpose, to stand in between man and God, mano y deo. That's what a priest does. They stand in between God and man, making intercession, making the gap to save lives, to stop sin, to give salvation, to give knowledge, to give mercy, to give a second chance. It's like that parable of vineyard where one of the vines and trees was not producing fruit. And the guy said, why should this waste the water? So let's throw it out and throw it in the fire. And the guy said, wait, let me fertilize it and dig around it and give it one more year. After that, it's on me. And if not, you're free to go. Right? In other words, and if not, let it bear fruit for your name. But I'm going to choose to save, if you will, to, to, to mitigate loss and to stand in the gap in the name of Jesus Christ, or rather to, to do what God has done for us, to be God's hands and feet. Now, one other time, Joseph makes a mediation. And again, I want you to know that God took note of this. Do you know one time Reuben had mandrakes? Mandrakes are these roots, and they're supposed to be used for medicinal purposes, they say they're an aphrodisiac or they help in childbearing. They also would say when you pull it out, it made a little sound. And so it kind of a weird thing around them. But again, uh, something in the old world that was a very desirable uh, delicacy. And what ended up happening is Reuben had these mandrakes 
And Rachel says to Leah, give me some of your son's mandrakes. And then uh, Leah goes, is it enough that you took my husband from me and now you want my son's mandrakes? And she said, only if you tell your husband to come on to me. And so Rachel says, okay. So she gives the mandrakes from Reuben and then Jacob goes on to Leah again and gives birth to Issachar. Now again, if Reuben hadn't have given over his possession, Issachar would not have happened historically. So here's another trade from the one who lost his birthright. Another was given birth. And the name Issachar means there is a reward or his reward will come. In other words, imagine this now, that Reuben lost his firstborn blessing, but he ultimately gave birth metaphorically, symbolically, and literally because of his heroic deeds and his, and his interceding, his standing in the gap, he gave birth to a nation by saving Joseph. He literally saved a nation from perishing by allowing Benjamin to come back. And by him, by his charitable deed of giving the mandrakes to his mother to give to his uh, stepmother, if you will, to Rachel, that Issachar was born. So though Reuben did bad, God used it for the good. And this is kind of like Peter. He denied the Lord three times. And so the Lord came and said, do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then do love you. Then Peter gets discouraged because he doesn't understand that Jesus is giving him tit for tat, time for time. Peter dishonored the Lord. Jesus allowed Peter to honor him and infirm him again. Peter dishonored the Lord. Jesus gave him an ability and affirmed him again. Peter dishonored the Lord and Jesus secured it. Feed my lamb. So he recommissioned him, or rather, he reminded him that commission never stopped just because he was unfaithful. Jesus remained faithful. Now with Reuben, he saved Joseph. He allowed his father and Joseph to be reconciled. And again, we know by giving the mandrakes, Issachar is born. So God used it for the good. Reuben, firstborn, do not be discouraged. You will not die. You will not be few. God will still use you for the good. God can do anything for the good. He can bring more good. Just like when David sinned and the census caused so many people to die in Israel. And then he saw the angel stop on the threshing floor and he made an atonement for them right there on the threshing, the threshing floor. That ended up being the house of the temple. And even though he committed adultery with Bathsheba, so bad, so terrible, a reproach like Reuben, he ended up having with Bathsheba another son named Solomon who ended up building the house of God. Do you understand that God can use even more, more than you can ask, think, or imagine? He can turn your mistakes into a masterpiece. Beloved, don't quit. Just because you sinned, get up. Ask Jesus Christ for atonement. Ask him for forgiveness. Ask him, commit your, and confess and commit your sins. Repent from them and turn and do good. And perhaps with you, it also may be that in the end, you did more good because of the mercy of God and that he uses all things for the good than any bad you could have ever done. I want you to be free in your conscience. If you turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, he can make your conscience new. He can renew your heart. He can renew your memory. Beloved, nothing is hard for our God. He's the God of Reuben. He was used more for the good than any of the bad. Remember, God is good. and All that he does is right, righteous and good. And through Reuben also, those who were half Gentile were brought to be co-heirs with Benai Israel, the nation of Israel. And we know that only in Jesus Christ that we are truly all made one. Jew, Gentile, Greek, Scythian, slave or free, male or female, there's Echad, the one in Jesus Christ who gave his life as a dowry, as a ransom for us with his own blood that you and I may become children of the Most High God, that we may have the right to become the sons of God and live forever. When Joseph later on rises to power. And remember, Reuben didn't save his life. Joseph wouldn't be there. So this is a very big deal. So the very first bright, the very firstborn blessing that belonged to Reuben went to Joseph's children, but he wouldn't have had children if Reuben didn't save his life. Very big deal. Okay, now, later on, when Joseph and his brothers are reconciled right before this, when he think, when he says, you're spies, they're saying we're not. They don't recognize him as Joseph because his name has changed. He's Appanathbaneah. All of a sudden, he says, your spies, they know we're not. We have a younger brother or father. He says, then prove it. Bring him to me. So they leave Simeon behind. They go, and then they're going to take Benjamin. And Jacob says, no, 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 no. You guys, Joseph was disappeared 28 years later. I'm not going to die in misery over this. You cannot take my 
my son Benjamin, he's the only, basically the only last joy, my baby. Don't take him from me. And Reuben again stands up and says, hey, I will take him and bring him back. If not, you can kill my two sons. And he stands in the gap again. Hey, we got to do this to save the people. And history records, Benjamin comes back. They're reconciled. Then Jacob comes to Egypt and they settle in the land of Goshen. And here is the story. The Exodus is set up to take place after Moses is born. So Reuben, though he lost his firstborn blessing, he did not lose the traits of a firstborn to save and protect his family. And again, this is more, more important because if you had a firstborn blessing, but you didn't have firstborn virtue, uh, though you'd have double, you know, like the prodigal son, you could have double the wealth and squander it away. But virtue, right? So now he was, now he did do dishonor. Let's get this straight. He was uh, a reproach. He did not do an honorable thing and it stained him. It was like a scar. But what he did as a tikkun to heal and to repair because he did have, you know, in other words, anyone can make a mistake and still be a good heart. Even David made a reproach like that. And it was a stain. And yet he was the apple of God's eye. He did such good. He fought to save the people of Israel. So tell me what's greater, sin or salvation? Tell me what's greater, make a mistake or rising from the a righteous man falls seven times, but he gets up. What is better, a man who's never sinned, right? Which we know all have sinned, or one who's sinned and repents and never sins again. Like David said, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Other times he said, Lord, if you deliver me from this, I will tell all people about this as well. To tr I'll become a signpost to turn people from iniquity. And that's what Reuben did. He made such a bad mistake, but then he turned his brothers. Don't go down that path. In other words, I've learned the hard way. Don't do the same thing. And this is the voice of wisdom. This is now where he partners with wisdom and cries out, it's better to save life than to lose it. It's better to honor your brother. Look, our brother could be set straight, but if you kill him, he'll never have that chance. And again, you also understand what gift we have to repent, to turn, and that God does forgive. Now, there are consequences to sin. And this is something that some people, it's so hard to live with, but you also know that God can make everything right. Remember how many years Joseph was gone before he's reconciled to his father. And remember Reuben, if what he did was a dishonor, imagine if he would have let Joseph die. Game over, not just for Reuben, for everyone. So you think God wouldn't view that in the, in the most high mercy? No, as a matter of fact, because you saved a life, what did Moses say? Reuben will not die. Law says life for life. But I tell you, because he saved a life, he didn't only just gain one, he gained a nation. This is called Benai Israel. So I want you to remember not to view people only by their mistakes, because if we only view him by his mistakes, we would lose the fact that we wouldn't have had a nation if it wasn't for Reuben. I also want you to understand that the same Reuben who interceded once, interceded twice, once for Joseph, and then again on behalf of Benjamin, because of Joseph for his whole family which is the nation of Israel. Now, the son that I'm referring to in the highest esteem that gave his life for us is Jesus Christ. He laid down his one life to receive a nation of believers, all who would come to him forever, as long as the world spins by faith in his name and by his name and by the personage who made the name great, Yahshua, the Lord saves, the Lord's our savior. He came and laid his life down for us so that we who made mistakes like Reuben or like anyone else who sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and the wage of sin is death, came to give everlasting life by that one gift. For behold, a son, behold the Lord. And speaking of behold, a son, see the son stands in the gap. Watch how this ties into the Brit Kadash, the New Testament. Behold, Jesus Christ, the name of God, right? The hand, Yod, hey, behold, the nail, Behold, behold the hand, behold the nail. Behold the hand, behold the nail that stands in the gap between man and mankind, between man and God, between sin and salvation, between death and life. You see, Reuben, again, though he suffered reproach, was used in the most honorable way. Behold the sun to stand in the gap, right? Take your eyes now off the track record of the man and look at the meaning of his name in the story in the DNA of Benai Israel. Behold, a man will stand in the gap. Behold, a man will stand to save. Behold, a man will stand so that one lives. 
instead of one dying. Behold, one will stand and agree with God's will to trade a ransom for the people. You see, Reuben is used in a mighty way in the etymology of his name. Just like Moses means to draw out of the water, well, we crossed the Red Sea. We came out of the water. So the name means all the much more than the man who had it. But it's given to him as a person in the story so that we can look at the DNA of what God's doing in every situation and or circumstance. Now, here's our closing thought. Romans 8.28 says, All things work together for the good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. Reuben was loved before the foundation of the world and called according to God's purposes. Therefore, all things, every situation, every circumstance worked for the good in the life of Reuben. He ended up doing more good in the end of his days than in the beginning. This is also what is written, God saves the best for last. We learned this by the wedding of Cana at Galilee. So behold, the son, behold the firstborn and the rights of a firstborn. Behold the honor of a firstborn. It's beyond a blessing. It means to serve. It means to protect. It should mean to atone, and it should mean to ransom. A firstborn's job, his right, is to defend and protect the family, to defend and protect the name, to defend and protect his siblings, and to protect and defend the history and the personality and the nation of believers that have been given right as sons of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you.